It is now time for members' statements. I recognize the member for Ottawa Centre. You got it, Speaker. Thank you very much, Speaker. And it's an honour to rise in this House today. I, I rise in this House today to bring a very clear message from my community in Ottawa Centre, from our party, and I actually believe from this entire House. Trans people exist. Trans people matter. And all of those who want to suggest otherwise are living in an alternate reality. This House, in the last Parliament, passed Toby's Law. Toby's Law was something that was brought forward with the sponsorship of the current Deputy Premier. Toby's Law was something that acknowledged something which is startling to me, that 77 per cent of trans youth have contemplated suicide and 45 per cent of trans youth have attempted it. We have to create a province that's loving and compassionate, Speaker. And I think at home of people like DJ Friedman, Beck Jacks Links, Thane Robin, Caden Seaburn, and Lyra Evans, the first elected education trustee, trans education trustee in our country's history. That's the future. Let's not look to the past. I want to salute Minister Thompson for saying very clearly in this House earlier today that that is not going to be the policy of this government. I want to salute my friend David Pacini from Northumberland, uh, Peterborough, who said very clearly to me earlier today he's going to be driving two hours to a protest at his office to support translates and to participate in it. That's the signal we're sending from this House today, and those who think otherwise should live in a different reality, not the one we live in today. Thank you, Speaker. Member statements. The member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today, in honour of Eczema Awareness Month, the month of November, I would like to speak about the Eczema Society of Canada, a registered Canadian charity dedicated to improving the lives of Canadians living with eczema. Eczema is a chronic inflammatory skin disease characterized by symptoms such as itch, dryness, and rash, which can cause the skin to ooze, crack, and bleed. It is a spectrum condition, and while it can be mild and often well-managed, on the other end of the spectrum, it can be moderate or severe, in which case it can be intensely itching, painful, debilitating, and life-altering. Eczema Society of Canada offers education and support programs to guide eczema patients and caregivers, regardless of the severity of their condition. They also educate Canadian health care providers to improve eczema care in Canada and in the past two years has provided certified or accredited continuing med medical education programming to over 8,000 health care providers across Canada. This is a crucial time for eczema patients in Canada, as recent research breakthroughs have led to many new drugs being developed for this condition. You can learn more about the Eczema Society of Canada and their programs by visiting eczemahealth.ca. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Windsor to come see. Uh, thank you, Speaker. We aren't wearing our poppies anymore, but we are still in the month of remembrance. So with that in mind, I'd like to put on the record a poem written recently by George Eliot Clark. He's a former Canadian Parliamentary Poet Laureate and a former Poet Laureate of Toronto. Acadia University in Nova Scotia asked Mr. Clark to write an alternative poem to the one we all know in Flanders Fields. Here's his poem. An armistice at last. That great war, that war to win war, didn't. Thus, every November the 11th at 11 a.m., ardent and strident as bagpipes, we pray, baying just for that, peace at last and a peace that lasts. Instead of studying grave plots with marble nobles, statued soldiers, the famed plus unknown dead, lifelike and stoic postures, foibles? Nay, their heroics rendered them lifeless, then deathless, now they gesture and beckon. New gallants to new fronts and success at killing or dying, choose what reckons. If only an armistice summoned peace, not mere pause betwixt each bloody decease. Speaker, once again, we see the value in poetry and in having a Poet Laureate. Great Britain has had a Poet Laureate for something like 400 years. Canada has had one since 2002. We have them in towns, cities, and counties all across Ontario. So other provinces have them, and there's no good reason why the province Ontario doesn't have one. And again, I call on the Conservative government to name a Poet Laureate for Ontario.
Member statements. The member for Niagara West. Thank you, Speaker. Um, Hospice Palliative Care members are here today visiting Queen's, Queen's Park, and they're here to talk about something no one really likes to talk about. They're here to talk about dying. It's truly the elephant in the room. We don't want to talk about it, but it's the one thing that we all have in common. We're all going to die, and we're all going to lose loved ones. Very few of us, though, Speaker, will die suddenly. In fact, 97% of Canadians will know when the end of life is coming, and they will need care. They'll need medical, spiritual, physical, psychological, social, and many other types of supports. That's what hospice palliative care is. It's holistic care to help us all live as well as possible to the natural end of life. And that can often happen, happen at home or in residential hospice. Speaker, we need more hospice palliative care here in the province of Ontario. And that's why I'm proud to say that my private member's bill, which was supported unanimously in this House, the Compassionate Care Act, has passed second reading and provides for a framework and reporting timelines to help us meet the inevitable demand for care. I want to encourage all members in this House to welcome the compassionate care workers for their communities and thank them for all they do, because nothing else matters when the elephant is in the room. Thank you. Statements. The member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today I wrote a letter to the government. Dear government, what you're doing is hurting me. It's hurting us. But you don't seem to want to listen. When I was elected, I made a commitment to represent the people in my riding of Kitchener Centre. That means the people who voted for me and those who didn't. The people who are straight, like me, and those who identify as queer. And I'm pretty sure that that's the same for you, isn't it? Well, when I found out about the resolution you overwhelmingly passed to no longer believe in trans folks, I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed because no matter what we say here today, the damage has already been done. The fear our trans friends and families feel is real. It's real today. We've spoken about this before. When you rolled back sex ed and removed overt references to LGBTQ communities, I stood up and I spoke out. I reminded you then in the way that I'm going to remind you today. Not talking about something doesn't make it go away. So let me be clear. As a member of the official opposition, I will keep speaking to you about the harm that you're doing, no matter how angry you get, no matter how much you try to ignore me, and no matter how hard you fight. Because trans rights are human rights. It's time to do better. Our children are watching. Sincerely, MPP Laura May Lindo. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Don Valley East. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, today, I want to talk about the Anti-Racism Directorate. It's been uh, roughly half a year since uh, Doug Ford and the Conservatives were elected into power in this province, and. Um, uh, I want to bring up the fact that we still don't know what the status is of the anti-racism directorate. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in 2016, uh, in February, we established the anti-racism directorate. We had 10 public meetings across the province. A strategic plan was put forward in March of, that, of 2017. And we also passed the Anti-Racism uh, Act in 2017, June 1st, and an annual conference was held uh, that year. Um, the first anti-black uh, racism strategy was put forward in December of 2017, and the OPS followed up with an anti-racism policy in February of 2018. And the standards, the anti-racism standards, were established on April 23, uh, 2018. Mr. Speaker, since then we've heard absolutely nothing about the anti-racism directorate. And uh, like the previous uh, speaker said, not talking about something uh, doesn't mean that it, uh, it's going to go away. We need to talk about racism here in the province of Ontario. Racism is on the rise, and we need to make sure that we have a government that understands that when we all reach our full potential, Ontario reaches its, its full potential and makes Canada a better place. So I'd ask the government uh, to, uh, to come forward uh, with the next steps for the anti-racism directorate and allow us to reach our full potential as a province. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member from Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On November 11th, Poland celebrated its 100th anniversary of national independence. For Poles living all over the world, it is a day to salute those who have fought and died courageously to resist tyranny and preserve Polish sovereignty. 
On November the 8th, I was honoured to commemorate this historic day by co-hosting a flag-raising ceremony and non-partisan reception with Mr. Krzysztof Jelczyk, Consul General of the Republic of Poland, alongside my colleagues, the member from Etobicoke Centre and the member from Humber River Black Creek. Together with the Premier, the Deputy Speaker, and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, my colleagues and I were thrilled to welcome several Polish government officials to Queen's Park, including Mr. Stanisław Karczewski, Speaker of the Senate of the Republic of Poland, Senators Aleksander Bobko and Piotr Florek, and Minister Jakub Kowalski. The day was filled with fruitful discussions about Ontario and Poland's thriving relations and how our governments can work together to foster even deeper economic and cultural ties based on innovation, trade, investment, and exchange of human resources. Speaker Kaczewski commended the 1.1 million strong Polish diaspora in Canada for their excellent organization and work in preserving Polish traditions, culture, and language in Canada, while being stellar and diligent contributors to the Canadian cultural, scientific, political, and social fabric. Premier Ford expressed his enthusiasm and interest in working with Speaker Kaczewski and the government of Poland, restating our government's position that Ontario is open for business, which includes being open for business with Poland. Lastly, I would like to thank all the MPPs in attendance, my wonderful staff, the Premier's Office, and the many individuals involved in making this historic celebration a success. On behalf of the Polish Canadi Canadian community here in Ontario, I thank you. Salat Polska. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Kiewetnong. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to talk about a critical role for uh, airports uh, that play uh, a critical role in the far north uh, in this province. Uh, while most people in Ontario uh, count on roads, highways, railways, and the transit, transit systems that we, uh, to get around, remote First Nations uh, communities count on airports. Uh, Ontario has, uh, has one of the more uh, remote First Nations than any other region in Ontario. Um, uh, I can say uh, that airports are a lifeline for the flying communities in the north. Um, so uh, when we take, talk about uh, the safety and the well-being of our people, uh, families uh, depend on the systems, on, depend on the airports for uh, health care, for uh, economic development, uh, food security, food shipments, emergency care, high school, and because we, we have to send out our, our children for high school and then out of the community by air. Uh, and also, even with the effects of uh, climate change, First Nations uh, uh, communities have to rely on airports even more. As I said before, uh, in, like, warmer climates mean that there's a far, uh, shorter season of uh, ice roads and uh, miigwech. Thank you very much. Member statements. The member for Mississauga Lakeshore. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mississauga Lakeshore is home to many great businesses that support Ontario families and provide good, well-paying jobs supporting local economy. Last Friday, I had the pleasure to visit one of these businesses. Hatch was founded in the GTA, but has grown into a global operation with, just, with projects in more than 150 countries and employs over 9,000 people worldwide. Hatch is an example of exploring Ontario's economic and local communities. However, what Hatch continues to do best is invest in Ontario and support Ontario families. Yeah, yeah. Hatch employs more than 2,000 Ontarians, including 1,500 in my riding on Mississauga Lakeshore. Mm -hmm. when, when we talk about in innovation, we need to look no further than companies like Hatch. During my visit, I went on a virtual tour of the Unit 6 reactor vault in Bruce Power. Yeah, yeah, Bruce Power. A tool to build and to help with Bruce major uh, replacement set to begin in 2020. Together, these companies are delivering on Ontario's largest infrastructure project at Bruce Power, which will support 22,000 direct and indirect jobs annually and provide $4 billion in annual benefits wow. through direct and indirect investment. It will help keep the lights on in Ontario well into 2064. Companies like Hatch and Bruce Power are innovating and creating jobs throughout the province and creating Made in Ontario solutions for major infrastructure projects. I am proud of the work these Ontario businesses are doing right here in Mississauga Lakeshore, and I'm proud that Ontario is open for business once again, here, Mr. Here. Speaker. Bruce Power Nuclear, here, here. Member statements? The member for Brampton South. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise today to uh, express uh, uh, my support for an issue that has uh, come up in my riding of Brampton South. Uh, a lot of uh, members of my community and in Brampton South have been facing uh, some issues and difficulty uh, as owner-operators uh, with uh, CN Rail, and I had a chance to visit them uh, not too long ago, two, uh, two weeks ago, with my colleague uh, Amarjat Sandhu, and I know uh, the member from Milton also had an opportunity uh, to visit them uh, as well as uh, uh, we listened to their concerns. Uh, uh, primarily around uh, safe working conditions uh, uh, and also uh, access uh, uh, to uh, sanitary ba bathroom use uh, on the job. Uh, truck drivers uh, are, are the base of our economy. They are hard workers, and we want to uh, ensure uh, that we lend our support, uh, I lend my support uh, to them uh, as they uh, use uh, their resources uh, and as they uh, bring awareness uh, to their cause uh, at CN. So uh, I want to make sure uh, that uh, their voice is also heard here in the House, and we want to make sure uh, that their hard-earned money that they've put towards their trucks uh, and uh, the, the resources that they use uh, also uh, go uh, notice. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to once again reassure that I stand with all the hardworking truck drivers uh, across this province uh, and request uh, the members at CN to take uh, notice of the issues that uh, they have put forward. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for London North Centre has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Education concerning changes to education curriculum. This matter will be debated tomorrow at 6 p.m. Reports by committees.